If 2024 has taught us anything, is that the girlies need their serotonin. From girl dinner to the Stanley Cup Civil War and even just a sweet treat or two, it's only natural that the next big social media trend would be trinkets. And with Blindbox Giant Potmart having over 500 stores globally and even more vending machines, it is easier than ever for the average shopper to discover a whole new world of cute collectibles. But of course, like with any fashion trend, we are seeing drama, overconsumption, the emergence of new aesthetics or corification, and inevitably a short supply of the most popular brands. We're even starting to define ourselves by which type of trinket we support. Are you a smisky girl or a skull panda baddie? This is the era of trinketry, my friends, a fashion fad defined by self-expression. So first of all, the term trinket when it comes to social media is kind of vague. According to the ever-reliable Miriam Webster, a trinket is a small item or accessory of typically low value. And in this sense, trinketry has been around for thousands of years in some form or another. One of humanity's earliest forms of art was wood carving, a practice that was found in many different cultures globally and throughout history. These handmade small statues or pieces of jewelry could be considered one of the earliest forms of trinketry, signifying a deeper human urge which reflects the fashion and culture of the time. In Western culture especially, it's really easy to track the popularity and existence of certain trinkets throughout history, with these items often being a signifier of wealth or travel. One fun trinket trend from the 17 to 1800s was Pugs. Yes, Pugs the dog. These flat-faced grumbly good boys were a very popular and exotic breed at this time, leading their image to be immortalized in porcelain and ceramic for consumers. From statues to snuff boxes, Pugs were immortalized for keen-eyed collectors. And in fact, around this same time period, trinkets were so well recognized that products were specifically made and marketed to store your trinkets, these being the infamous trinket dishes or trinket boxes. In the late 1970s, the world was introduced to the doe-eyed precious moment statues created by Samuel Butcher. Originally starting as just characters in a greeting card, these small porcelain people had teardrop eyes and very soft expressions, very quickly blowing up in a family value loving America. At the end of the 1980s, the official precious moments park in Missouri would officially open its doors. And if you like the look of precious moments, then you can still visit this park as it's operating to this day. Day. Needless to say, the 21st century is not the first period of time to have trinkets be on trend. But arguably, unlike many other periods in history, it's easier than ever for people to buy into this hobby. For example, the average Potmark blind box usually retails around 15 to 20 UK pounds. So around 25 to 30 dollars for you Americans. And sure, that can definitely still be out of budget for some. But I can tell you now, as a longtime figure collector, it's a far more accessible hobby than many other types of collecting. Blind box trinkets have become so popular that you can find them from high street retail retailers like HMV, Miniso, or even supermarkets. I'd also say that trinket culture today is far more removed than that of our grandparents' porcelain animals or ornate brooches. Instead, the items that we collect today are far more rooted in modern pop culture and kawaii culture. Moving on from the days where women would collect precious moments, instead young women are collecting sunny angels. As always, history is repeating itself in a newer and more animated medium. Now, when I was a kid, liking anime or cartoons or toys past the age of 10 was considered lame. It didn't help that I brought in my club penguins on a year seven school trip and proceeded to tell everybody the lore that I'd made up in my head about them. No, I'm not kidding. I really did bring all of my club penguin toys on a school trip with me. Can you believe that I wasn't popular? Historically, being nerdy has never correlated to being considered cool. I'm sure we've all seen movies and TV shows where the nerds get pushed around by the jocks and get mocked for liking comic books, having their drawings unceremoniously ripped up in in front of them. Being geeky wasn't always in vogue. When YouGov UK did a 2015 poll asking people of different ages how they'd feel being considered a nerd, the vast majority of people between the ages of 18 to 40 said they would either feel positively or neutral about it, with only 16% saying that it would outwardly bother them. Meanwhile, with the over 40s who were polled, only 15% would be happy to be considered a nerd, with the rest being unbothered or actively unhappy with being called that. Although the divide is slowly closing, it definitely feels like younger generations are the ones destigmatizing this love of pop culture and not feeling the need to grow up really, really fast. And another more recent development is about women in pop culture. Moving on from just being the dyed hair love interest for a geeky guy, women are slowly regaining their own space and autonomy in these niches, with brands realizing that women have disposable income too, and are more than willing to empty their pockets on things that they enjoy. You could argue that women's involvement in pop culture and kid art marketing is why so many fashion trends and brands involve typically more femme adjacent media, with big designers even jumping on the bandwagon with 
Jimmy Choo releasing its second Sailor Moon collaboration this year, and the infamous and iconic Loewe Studio Ghibli collections. Hell, we even have mainstream celebrities and musicians who are openly unapologetically a fan of anime and pop culture. Honestly, I can make a whole video about women's place in pop culture and their influence in the pop culture market because it really is an interesting timeline and story to explore and honestly a really key component in many fashion trends and marketing that we're seeing today. And we will be touching on that in this video but we're not going to go into it in depth so let me know if you want to see that as a separate video another time. Pop culture went from something that we would consume behind closed doors to being something that's considered chic. And this isn't just a western phenomena. Globally we have seen a massive market shift where there is a lot less shame about being a fan or being in a fandom. And as I've said before, nowhere does it quite like Japan. Now I have talked about Oshi culture and Oshikatsu in my previous Eater Bag video, but I really feel that Oshikatsu has had a pretty big impact on the West and how we're showing our fandom openly. Now, for those who are unfamiliar with the term or didn't get to watch my last video, which I highly recommend that you do, Oshikatsu means to support your favorite. The act of showing your dedication to a certain person, character, or series through fan behavior. Stuff like Eater Bags, collaboration cafes, or just collecting merchandise. And for the biggest supporters of the Oshi, they will spend hundreds or thousands on it, making sure that they buy all of the rare and exclusive merchandise, and of course, attending any in-person events that they're able to go to. They have to ensure that their dedication is visibly obvious. In fact, when I was in Harajuku this past week, there was actually a pop-up collaboration which kind of had this effect. There was a small pop-up shop and art murals dotted around Takashita Street for the musical group Naite. Now, Naite keep their faces anonymous, and so they have anime characters that are for their persona. And when I say that Harajuku was rammed, I am not kidding. I tried to get some footage without making it weird, because obviously people were just trying to mind their own business, but I did get some street footage and as you can see, it was really, really busy. And I mean, Takashita Street is never quiet. It is a highly dense tourist area, but this time it was packed full of Jedi K girlies, people wearing Rio Zangata, Subcol and popular street fashion, all hoping to pick up exclusive merch and take photos of their favorite. Equally, Oshi culture doesn't have to be super extreme or really expensive. In fact, according to the Japan Times, 60% of Japanese mums also take part in Oshikatsu activities. On average, spending around two £250 per year on these fan activities. When I was at the Magical Chikawa pop-up in Shinjuku, I saw loads of women of all ages there to buy items. Grabbing t-shirts, keychains, and rushing to the checkout, I saw women in their 40s, 50s, and even 60s. And not gonna lie, it was just a cute reminder that girls are girls no matter where you're from. Another big thing about Japan is also how wide the second-hand market is for these small, low-cost collectibles. If you go to places like Sudogaya, Nakano Broadway, or even Book Off, you will be inundated with choice. It is a veritable treasure trove for collectors or just tourists wanting to get low-cost souvenirs to bring back home. You can find pretty much anything you can think of from the rare and obscure to the popular and most recent. And this trinket aspect of Oshikatsu has definitely become more present in the West post-2020, as we're seeing the availability of gacha machines increase, collaboration events in local malls, as well as wearable fandom like eater bags and clear display pouches for figurines and plush. Japan's love for displaying things that you enjoy in a protected way has definitely migrated way more into the wider Western market. And so you may be wondering if there is a specific name or aesthetic given to more kawaii pop culture items and trinkets. Maybe you're trying to look for cute charms to add to your bag and don't know where to start. Well, thanks to 2024 TikTok, there is a call for everything. And in this case, it's called Jumino Call. Now, Jumino Call was seemingly coined and created by TikTok user Jumino Jewels, a Canadian based small business that started around 2022 that designs and makes a variety of kawaii collectibles and cute accessories. With their videos going viral numerous times earlier this year, they ended up officially soft launching this new internet aesthetic. And honestly, big respect to Jumino Jewels for all the success that they've had so far. From what I can gather, the designer and runner of this store is a 17 year old, and that's like insanely impressive. I'm just hoping that one day I won't miss the pre orders and can finally take home that green melon pan turtle plush. Please just let me bring him home. Now, Jumino Call is fairly vague and all encompassing of a lot of Japanese kawaii media, both compiled of existing characters and original designs, with the only real rule of this aesthetic being a nostalgic 2000s Japan kind of vibe. Old video games and consoles, retro tech like flip phones or the early iterations of Tamagotchis, cartoon animals or anime mascots, basically the kind of stuff that you used to be able to buy with your pocket money when you were a kid. In my opinion, it has this calming, almost 
almost summertime, summer holiday energy to it. And clearly this aesthetic resonates with a lot of netizens. As you can find an abundance of rework videos, collages and compilations over on TikTok and Pinterest. However, this isn't necessarily the first iteration of this aesthetic because before Jumino Core, we had Heisei Retro. Now Heisei Retro is very similar to Jumino Core, being a fashion and visual aesthetic centered around the late 90s to early 2000s Japan, playing on millennial and older Gen Z's love of nostalgic media and their childhood, as well as playing on this false sense of nostalgia with a bigger Western population. Heisei Retro has pretty much the exact same vibes as Jumino Core, but the only real difference being that Heisei Retro typically has search results with a more hyper feminine angle to them, whilst the results for Jumino Core tend to be a bit more bright, airy and gender neutral. But honestly, this really varies from search result to search result and as a whole there isn't really a lot of separation between them. Now I won't lie, I have always been a lover of retro 2000s Japanese media. Series like Lucky Star are my go-to anime if I need a bit of comfort and when I go shopping in Japan I typically gravitate more towards things like Doko Demo Isayo or Rilakkuma. One of my core memories on early YouTube was discovering remont sets and squishies. I would watch them through online videos here on YouTube and I would be desperate to find them, literally begging my parents to try and help me get hold of a remont set with tiny little cupcakes or trying to find a squishy of a melon pan. Buying industrial white silicone from the local DIY store in order to make my own deco den phone cases. Were you really a preteen weeb if you didn't overspend on pop and cooking kits? And I guess these two aesthetics bring us on to our first long-standing TikTok trinket trend. This being the famous and inaccessible Sunny Angels. Now I know if you're watching this video you have at least seen a sunny angel in passing. They are an unavoidable part of the TikTok collector sphere. Originally created in 2004 by Toru Soya and directly inspired by the iconic Cupie Baby, sunny angels are doughy little dudes with a passion for fashion. The goal of these angels according to their creator was to ease the stress of the Japanese working woman, with sunny angels at times being referred to your pocket boyfriend or your little boyfriend. Their round bodies, cute hats and big eyes are admittedly very disarming and pretty calming to be around. And for the best part of 20 years they ticked along at their own pace in their own market. But like with a lot of Japanese kawaii media it was post 2020 that really kicked things into motion. Small shops and businesses who were already selling kawaii blind boxes started to notice a significant uptick in sales. But it was mid to late 2023 that really cemented Sunny Angels permanency on store shelves. Shops that were selling Sunny Angels were selling out in mere minutes. Resellers were buying in bulk. And stores that weren't already on the bandwagon were trying their best to make sure that they could stock these chubby little dudes. It became pretty normal for girl dates to include an impromptu unboxing of a sunny angel, lamenting when instead of getting a cute cherub in a cat hat they ended up pulling a Robbie. <gasps> what is it? The one you wanted? It's a fucking Robbie! No! Robbies are equally as, if not more, sought after than Sunny Angels, with people buying multiple full sets of blind boxes in order to try and pull one. And Loki, I'm not surprised if you take a look at their insane aftermarket pricing. So I guess no matter what you pull, it's a win-win. And in a short matter of months, these tiny toddlers were like blood diamonds on the market, with the most popular designs and chases of each set being resold on the secondhand market for sometimes quadruple their original retail price. If you wanted to get hold of one, you'd have to be luckier and quicker than every other fan out there. In Japan, all the secondhand stores that had Sunny Angels available had them locked away or security tagged. They were not playing games. If you wanted to get hold and adopt your own angel, you need to bust out your best Duolingo skills and walk your ass over to the counter. And the popularity of Sunny Angels meant that they got the Oshikatsu treatment, with the Western women taking inspiration and buying clear pouches to carry around their favourite angel, as well as lobotomizing their remaining angels to turn into cute bag charms. In fact, in the past couple months there is an official Sunny Angel crew bag which can hold up to eight Sunny Angel babies so you can take them on the go. Can't be leaving the house without the squad. Now in my opinion Sunny Angels didn't just mark the turn of digital trinketry and low-cost collectibles but also how these items can be used as a fashion statement in the same way as designer. Now of course your Gucci, Chanel, Louis, Hermes is far more premium and luxury but I believe it's the accessibility and mystery of a Sunny Angels blind box that catapulted them into a mainstream level of desirability. If you have Sunny Angels to spare and attach to your bag the girlies no, 
know that you have disposable income. Hell, you know you've done something right when SNL make a skit about your sunny angels and not only that but somehow manage to source a full wall of them. Sunny angels are absolutely a titan in the kawaii blind box market but they also help set the stage for the most recent trinket trend. The one that has people divided over whether it's ugly or whether it's cute or just black lighting their feet in order to know if they're actually authentic. Oh baby, it's time to talk about Laboo-Boos. The infamous Laboo-Boos were created by Belgium designer Kassing Lung in 2015. And despite looking like an extra from where the wild things are, these guys are actually meant to be elvish. And over time, these little creatures were given names and personalities in the Monster Story series. In fact, fun fact, Laboo-Boo is actually a specific name of one of these specific creatures, and it's a little girl or a little girl character. She's meant to be mischievous and fun, but also very kind to her friends. And as a whole, these little guys lived in relative mainstream media obscurity. Until one day, Blackpink's Lisa ended up posting photos on her Instagram of these cute collectibles. Taking selfies with these items for her Instagram stories, as well as attaching one of the Laboo bag charms to her blue Hermes Constance bag. Hermes bags typically start around the 10k mark and are invite only, so attaching a Laboo bag charm is a fashion statement within itself. We all know that K-pop has had a massive influence on fashion and internet trends for a while now, and with Blackpink's Lisa having over 104 million followers on Instagram, it was inevitable that these affordable little critters from Pop Mart would be given the star treatment, blown into the stratosphere of popularity. In Bangkok, when the first Laboo themed store opened, they took in $1.4 million on opening day. By my estimation, that's around 40,000 basic Laboo blind boxes sold within one day. And it wasn't just Bangkok and Thailand that were feeling the Laboo boom, because oh man, here in the West, we got the itch too. If you type in Laboo on TikTok, you'll be met with thousands of videos of people fighting to find a single blind box whilst others are boasting about having two full sets to open on camera. Some collectors have gone all in, decorating every single bag that they own with a Laboo kind of giving that same energy as the day of the week underpants. You'll see people giving more emotion at unboxing a Laboo than you'll see most men give at the gender reveal of their child. Yeah. No, I don't. Wait. <laughs> Another girl. Look. <laughs> <They're scared. laughs> it might seem like jokes, but people take this stuff super seriously. Now, one of my good friends actually works at a major Pop Mart store here in the UK, and I asked her what her thoughts and experiences were when it comes to dealing with people wanting Laboo-Boos. And here is what she had to say. No, Addy, you don't understand. The Laboo-Boo hype is crazy right now. People will queue from like six in the morning. Um, we don't open till 10. So they'll just wait and the queue will literally go so far down the road out of the shop. And people are committed. There was a guy, he literally got his st phone stolen in the queue for Laboo-Boo and he continued queuing. But yeah, I think it started from uh, Lisa Blackpink, um, but it literally hasn't died down. Every single day people ask for Laboo-Boo. People will travel to like all the stores in London just looking for Laboo-Boo. It's crazy. It's insane. Now, I naively thought that I would find a Laboo bag charm blind box when I was in Japan to open and unbox on video here for you. And needless to say, I was hugely mistaken. Now, the first one that I went to was in Harajuku, and the first thing that you saw when going through the Pop Mart door was a poster telling you that if you wanted to get a Laboo bag charm blind box, you needed to enter a lottery, and if you won, you could then proceed to purchase a blind box. The second store in Shinjuku also had this lottery system in place, as well as a huge poster basically saying that Japan had no Laboo left. If you wanted a Laboo you needed to gamble. I've made this joke with friends but it's becoming weirdly accurate but Laboo are kind of like the Birkin bag of the collectible world. Needing a purchase history and having to enter a lottery just to have the chance of winning one solitary blind box without any guarantee that you'd even like the colour or the character that you receive. What started as a low cost trinket has now become a symbol of exclusivity. And just like with anything that becomes popular people are now starting to steal Laboo off of people's bags. How is it that in 2024 it's safer to hit the town in your Cartier bracelet than it is to leave the house with your Popmark keychain? Thieves are unhooking or even worse, cutting the ribbon of the Laboo-Boos on people's bags, leading worried owners to find ways to prevent theft and stop the Laboo-Boo getting damaged. This includes replacing the O-ring keychain that it comes with and instead using an industrial strength lockable carabiner, cable ties just under the ribbon or to reinforce the ribbon to add extra protection, and even plastic Laboo-Boo shaped cases to stop 
stop them getting weathered by the elements. Once again, Laboo-Boos are giving Birkin. I feel the need to specify, but it really is only the bag charms that are this popular too. Like the regular blind boxes that have these standard figurines in them are nowhere near as popular and are still readily available from most Pop Mart retailers. Are people only buying Laboo-Boos because they get to show them off on social media? And I guess in my opinion, this is where a few issues arise. Now I've said it once and I'll say it again, I am the worst person to talk about overconsumption. I am a figure collector and clothes enthusiast and I have been for nearly 15 years. However, I do feel qualified to talk about the fast turnover and overconsumption of fashion trends like La Boo Boo, Sunny Angels and Trinket. People not buying into these things out of love or a long-term passion, but because they've been sold a fear of missing out. They want to take part in filming these unboxings and get views for owning these trinkets. They know that in a few months, the trend might move on and may no longer be as accessible to them. And the thing is wearing trinkets on your bags, your belts or your clothes is nothing new. Like I said before, trinkets existed way before social media was a marketing tool to push to the masses. In alternative fashion subcultures, accessorizing yourself with things that you like, whether it be keychains or pins, has always kind of been a thing. Wearable trinkets and charms are nothing revolutionary. It can just feel like that because it's only just hit the mainstream market. Suddenly things that have always been a pretty personal or easy to do DIY are being pushed out by fast fashion companies for insane prices. To me, a pretty clear example of this is the Minga London mass-produced trinket keychains. These carbon copy trinket keychains retail at 30 UK pounds, not including shipping, and in my opinion really exemplify how a fun trend that was all about expressing yourself or your fandom gets watered down into something that has no soul. The punked out keychain, for example, is currently out of stock somehow, but what you get for 30 pounds is the most basic selection of low-cost trinkets that they could get from Alibaba. A small plush, a rubber Minga tag, and a bunch of small metal items that really reflect the kind of items that you could easily buy as an individual from places like AliExpress. Also, just a personal ick of mine is when I see companies marketing stuff like this as punk. Punk is all about DIY and self-expression, and to me, it seems kind of soulless and hollow when you're marketing something that is a very simple DIY that was originally about expressing yourself and your beliefs as a 30 pound testament to capitalism and mass consumption. The same can be said for their pinky cute heart keychain, which again is somehow sold out. And it's arguably less original than the punked out one. The little resin love heart charm is especially such an AliExpress classic. Like I swore I've seen a million market stalls with those little hearts as earrings. Now I do understand that people may genuinely love the design of these keychains. I'm not here to yuck your yum, but I would argue you could very easily make something more personal and punk at home and for a significantly lower cost. I've actually made a bunch of my own trinket keychains just using a cheap pack of carabiners from eBay and a bunch of stuff that I had at home. Stuff that I've won from gacha machines, that I've bought in Japan from secondhand stores and stuff that I've been gifted or bought from small businesses. I personally think they look way, way cuter and most importantly, they say more about me and who I am and what I like. But let's say for whatever reason, you don't have the capability to make your own keychain. If you don't have the resources or physical ability to do it, where can you go? Well, Vinted and Depop are really, really good alternatives. They have a ton of different independent sellers who hand make keychains and make charms. I think they're super, super cute and a much better choice and much better value value than the Minga London alternative. I do truly worry that it is that same fast gratification that is driving people to pay £30 for a keychain that is making people buy not one blind box of Sunny Angel or La Boo Boo, but buying multiple sets to unbox, spending hundreds and thousands of pounds at a time, owning 10 La Boo Boo when truly you only really wanted one, and now you're struggling to figure out what to do with the rest of them. What will happen to half these trinkets in a year's time? Will they remain popular? Will people still be rushing to stores to buy them? Or will it, like many other fashion and internet trends, die out and slow down? Will we be seeing La Boo Boo turn up in charity and thrift stores by the end of 2020? Will the Minga London keychains last more than a couple of months of wear before they're suddenly considered cringe and end up gathering dust on somebody's dresser? I saw a really interesting video on TikTok that kind of had a look at the whole trinket trend debacle. Asking the question if you could purchase a trinket intentionally as a trinket, or if trinkets are just nonchalantly purchased or picked up over time with no valor needed. Naturally, I am not not here to ruin anybody's fun. I like seeing women having fashion trends that allow them to just enjoy themselves and be unapologetically girly or geeky without having to have the pressure of the male gaze involved. I like seeing things that I've enjoyed for years before suddenly reaching new audiences and gaining new popularity. Calling people poses because they didn't wear trinket keychains before it was cool or because they get excited about sunny angel blind boxes, it's just not necessary. As a general, the term poser is often just misused. It's used as a way of putting down women 
or newbies in niche spaces. But I think like with any trend, you should only buy what you mean to keep. Only cue for a Labubu if it means something to you off camera. You don't need to own a lot or spend a lot in order to be a valid fan of something. You have nothing to prove. So get crafty, buy a couple of carabiners and stack up your keychains. Hit up Vinted and find the figure that you actually want. Express yourself on your terms within your means. Not everything needs a label, not everything needs a trend, and not everybody who enjoys these trends is a poser. All I know is that I love a little treat. I love a sweet treat, I like a small treat, I love a trinket. But let me know, what do you guys think of trinket trends? What has been your favorite or least favorite trend of trinkets? When I asked you over on my YouTube community page, you guys overwhelmingly said that you love a little trinket, a little small treat. And hey, I'm with you on that. I love collecting little guys, I love collecting little figurines or hair clips or keychains. And if you're wondering whether I am a Labubu girly, a Labubu fan, I, I'm kind of not. Like, I don't think they're ugly. I don't think there's anything wrong with them. They're just not a bit of me. Honestly, I much prefer like Tamagotchi. I much prefer retro characters, Willakuma, Sanrio, like stuff that is still very mainstream popular in a lot of places or just as a general. But it will be a cold day in hell when I am up before nine o'clock in order to queue for a small treat. Also, look at that. You guys have been blowing all my videos up. I've only made two videos and so far they have outperformed my expectations massively. I, I had no big ambition when starting this channel. I had no expectations for massive amounts of views or followers and yet somehow we're nearly at 30K within a month really. And by the end of the year, I don't know where we'll be. So I really do just want to say a huge thank you for supporting my shift to making long form yappy content. And like as always, if I have made a mistake, please feel free to let me know. I had to pin a comment on my last video and I'm always happy to do so. So if you come at me in good faith and give me some feedback, give me more information or let me know I've made a mistake, I'm always happy to try and correct it or at least pin a comment to let people know. If you enjoyed my video, please check out my previous videos and hit that subscribe button in order to be notified whenever I next upload. But if you do desperately miss me and you want to see what I'm up to in between that time. I have my Instagram and I also have my TikTok, which recently hit 1 million followers. But as always, thank you so much for the support, for the engagement, for, for just chatting with me in the comments. I really, really appreciate it. But yeah, I will see you in the next video and it is time for an outfit check. Okay, here is a little outfit check for the end of the video. The necklace that I'm wearing is from Named Collective and these little hair clips, by the way, are from the Gasha machine uh, for the Bandai shop in London. These are the little Tamagotchi ones. I have Kuchipachi and I also have Mamechi. This t-shirt is from Six Dimension Shop and I think it is super, super cute and it is really, really comfy to wear when filming. Really breathable, really comfy. I really like it. 10 out of 10, recommend. And although you can't really see them when I'm filming, I'm also wearing these shorts from Wago. I got them when I was in Japan. They're really, really cool, distressed denim with this almost like cell shaded look to them. I really, really like them. Very, very comfy. So glad that I fit into Japanese pants. So, so stoked, so stoked because, oh my God, I would have been sad otherwise. <laughs>